Hey everyone, this is Steve Bradley, God's Wordsmith, and I'm coming to you with the parable of the vineyard workers in Matthew chapter 20. This is our first sermon on Matthew 20, and when we're done, there's a very interesting thing that's about to happen. Jesus is nearly to his last week before his crucifixion and resurrection. Now, at the end of chapter 20, he leaves Jericho, which is about 18 miles away from Jerusalem. At the beginning of chapter 21, he enters Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, otherwise known as Palm Sunday. The distance from Jericho to Jerusalem is about 18 miles, but potentially difficult and dangerous. So it probably took him somewhere near a day or a couple of days to get down to Jerusalem. And <clears throat> the amazing thing about it is that we are really at the end of his earthly ministry. And this brings to mind something that everyone who has read the Gospels a bit knows, and that is that the Gospels are loaded, quote-unquote, to emphasize the final days and hours of Jesus' life here on earth. So we're almost at the end. It doesn't seem like it. I mean, Matthew chapter 20, there are 28 chapters in Matthew, but we're just about there. So let's go to the teaching for today. So here's the text. Jesus said, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now, when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, and that is the standard wage in those times for what we would today call contract workers, he sent them into his vineyard, and he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, Go also into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, uh, the workday was twelve hours, by the way, he went out and find other, uh, found others standing idle and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and what is it, whatever is right, you will receive. So when any evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. When those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. When they had received it, they complained against the landover, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So, Jesus says, the last will be first and the first last, for many are called, but few chosen. So the question is, why this parable? Well, this parable actually refers back to the preceding chapter where Jesus makes this statement. And it's to teach about this statement. Many are called, many who are first will be last, and the last first. Now, folks, sometimes the chapter divisions don't make a great deal of sense, as here, because the parable he tells in Matthew chapter 20 about the landowner and the workers is actually part of his statements about the rewards of commitment. And that was our preceding sermon, so you can go back and look at that if you wish. 
So in the parable, as you know, the landowner goes out at various times of the day and hires additional people all the way to the 11th hour to get his vineyard harvested. When it's come time to pay them all, he has the last people he hired come first and gives them a denarius. King James Version, that's a penny, uh, but it's a full day's wage in those days. <clears throat> so the workers picked at the 11th hour were undoubtedly surprised and happy with their pay. Next he calls the others and he pays them the same from last to first. These workers were angry because they didn't get paid more since they worked all day. And so the landowner responds, and we just read this, but he answered and said, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called but few chosen. So this parable is about the landowner's right to do what he wants with his money, and it's a fitting introduction, <coughs> excuse me, to the sovereignty of God. Now many commentators, and I've read them, try to make this parable into a lot more than Jesus seems to have intended. Uh, because Jesus tells exactly what he meant by it and its implications. Folks, it's God's choice what to do with us. It's possible, of course, that additional interpretations or applications can be gleaned from what he says. But remember what Jesus said about the parable. The first shall be last and the last first, for many are called, but few are chosen. That was his statement about the meaning of the parable, and we kind of need to restrict ourselves to that. So the question is, <clears throat> how does this parable help you? Well, it helps your understanding. For example, see Psalm 139, verses 15 and 16, where David says, and this is one of the Psalms outside of 1 through 72 that was written by David, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written, the days fashioned for me when there as yet were none of them. Pick that up and think about it. The days fashioned for me were written. Now the King James Version is different, but the rendering I've chosen is the correct rendering. Folks, your life is deeply involved with God's sovereign choices. They have to do with who you are, what your life experiences will be, and the path he has chosen for you. Going back to the landowner's example, he chooses when you'll be hired. He decides what your pay will be. God has already made up his mind about the difficult days in your life and the good ones. He is with you in all of these. He has decided in eternity past where you will be born, what language you will speak, what opportunities you will have in your life, when you will be born. Your reaction to all of that is as you choose it to be, and that's very important to understand. You can choose to fight against it, but it's going to happen all the same. <clears throat> Consider what Jesus said to Ananias about the Apostle Paul when, God, when he called Ananias to baptize Paul. I'm sorry, originally called Saul. Some don't know that. But the person whom we are introduced to as Saul in chapter, in chapter 9, actually the end of chapter 8, is eventually called Paul because he took a Greek name. 
and eventually also called the Apostle Paul. So in Acts chapter 9, we read these words. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, call his name. And he said, Here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, that is, Paul the Apostle. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. And Ananias is saying a true statement. Paul was a truly evil man before his conversion. He gave witness against the Christians and had them put to death. He had them imprisoned. He did all he could against Christianity. And the Lord said to him, go. I love that. Pretty simple. Because when the Lord tells you something, he means it. Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. So now what differentiated Paul from others? God's sovereign choice. Think about it for a second. God said, Paul is mine. Same as he said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1. Before you were born, I knew you and I ordained you to be a prophet uh, to the nations. And of course, you may be as obedient as Paul was. And Paul was probably the single most successful evangelist and missionary in the world, ever. You may be just like him, but Paul was chosen to do what he did, and he did it. You're chosen for something else. What differentiates you? God's sovereign choice. He has the right to decide how you will be hired, when you will be hired, and what you will receive as your reward. <clears throat> so God chooses not only us, that would be us, and folks, we have choices too. I'm not saying that all of this is done independently of your own decisions, because it's not. Very fascinating illustration of the concept occurs in Ephesians where God says we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But prior to that, in the Gospel of John, well, not prior time-wise, because John was written later, but prior to that, in the Gospel of John, he has said, Whosoever will may come. Folks, you choose, and when you are when you've chosen, you find that that's also God's choice. God chooses not only you and me, He chooses our path. So if you look in Ephesians chapter two, verse 10, for we, that is Christians, are His workmanship. In other words, your personality, your level of intelligence, how you relate to the world, all of that is choice that God has made. How you react to that is what you do. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand 
that we should walk in them. Look at those words, God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If I had listened to that in certain parts of my life, I would have had a lot different life. The original language is very clear. It's actually pre-prepared, pre-set up, pre-did it. God prepared our works for us. He's prepared your works for you. If you're not a Christian yet, you can enter into that by simply receiving the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, I want to follow you. I want eternal life. I want what you've prepared for me. He preplanned our place and time of birth, the graces and gifts that we would be given, and what we would be called to do. He planned all that. Now, on the other hand, and this is a very important concept, we can choose to stray. We can choose to walk away from what God wants us to do, for a time at least. If we walk away permanently, it's questionable whether we were ever his. But it, it, that is the purpose of every one of Satan's temptations, whatever they are, whether it's money, power, sex, the three great ones. We can choose a path that runs counter to God's will. And if we keep on that path, it will destroy us. However, we can also choose to return to him and do the things that he called us to do in the first place. Many of God's people have discovered this, that they fall away and then come back. David, Peter, John Mark, Jeremiah, Jonah, and many more. I mean, as the writer of Hebrews 11 says, the time would fail me to tell you about all these people. Your failure is never final unless you refuse to return to the Lord and enter into his plans for you. Now, <clears throat> there are many people, I imagine, who have walked with God a long time and they're listening to this. And to those I say, keep going. As the book of Hebrews says, Run with patience, run with endurance, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And to those who may be listening, watching the, the video, if you wonder if you can return to the Lord, the answer is yes. You can. It may be difficult, I had a very dear friend years ago who had been a drug addict and he was a pastor, pastor of an extremely successful church and he started getting headaches and those headaches he went and he got drugs for them. Well he had been a drug addict and those drugs immediately sucked him back in just destroyed his walk, his ministry, his marriage, his relationship with his children, ruined his life. And then he came back. And no, he didn't have the church. No, he didn't have his wife. No, he didn't have his former life. It had all been ruined. But the Lord took him and rebuilt him and his life once he had returned. Was it his fault that he did all those things? Yes, it was his fault. <clears throat> As it has been my fault in the things that I've done. When you return to the Lord, it isn't the same world for you, but God has created alternatives. And he will bless you at the end of the day, so to speak, 
just as he blessed you if you went all day. Read Psalm 32. That is one of the most wonderful psalms in the whole Bible. And when you read it, you think about all the trouble that David went through during his time away from the Lord. And then you realize when he confessed his sin and he turned to the Lord, there was a complete emptying out of all of the evil in his life. And God took him back. And he's calling you back, if that's you. And to the final group, to those who are not just now being called into the vineyard, so to speak, I say, you will not be disappointed. There is no disappointment in Jesus. There just isn't. Your reward will be great in heaven. And as the scripture says, whoever puts his trust in him, that is the Lord, will not be ashamed, will not be disappointed. Whoever you are, there is time, but there is no time for delay. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of blessing. Today, the landowner, so to speak, calls you into his vineyard. Don't let it pass you by. May God richly bless you. Today and every day, this is Steve Bradley, God's wordsmith, signing off.